pastor spotlight and one that we do now monthly. So we're looking forward to some others and I'll share them with you later on um, uh, in this session, ones that are coming up next month and a few other things. So tonight's topic again is community connections. And I'm excited that um, Randall Curtis from Frenchtown Baptist Church in Frenchtown, Rhode Island is going to be moderating tonight. And he is also our regional coordinator. So we want to welcome Randall into our mix as he is going to be um, uh, taking over the reins. And I'm going to disappear so that he can uh, introduce our guests. So Randall, tell us a little bit more about you and um, the ministry that you have. And uh, you can take it away from here. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, yeah, I'm the Rhode Island Regional Coordinator. Uh, and in my role, I know one of our guests tonight, Ken, and uh, which I'm very pleased uh, to know Ken. And then uh, I'm meeting Mike tonight with everybody else. I'm excited about that uh, new connection. Uh, so yes, I am the, the, the pastor of Frenchtown Church in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, uh, which is uh, uh, just a great little church that's been around for 175 years. It's technically a replant. And I also uh, have a role with the, uh, the Baptist Churches of New England. Uh, but I'd like to get on to our guests. Uh, they're the real stars of the evening, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, maybe let's uh, start with Ken. Ken, can you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your church? All right. Hopefully this is working. So Okay, so I'm a co-vocational pastor. Uh, I work full-time during the day, and I work full-time for the church. I've uh, been there going into my seventh year now up at New Hope Baptist Church in Millville. It's about a 25-minute commute from my house. And I found myself going there when they were without a pastor. And um, I, I loved the small church environment. It's a lighthouse. There were some immediate concerns that had to be dealt with. We redid the bylaws, redid the statement of faith, and we had them join BCNE, which was huge. Um, and I'm just real excited to be a lighthouse in that community. And it it's it's difficult because I wish I could live there um, and be there full time living there instead of having to drive up and back and forth. Um, so my vision for the church is that at some point, uh, the church will get big enough where they can take on uh, another co-vocational pastor that's younger than me, I'm 61, um, and be able to have somebody who actually lives there <clears throat> and has kids that go into the community, into school, and then they can do some, some opportunities with that. That would be wonderful. But for now, it's me with my finger in the, in the dam, you know, holding, holding the water and building up our lighthouse there and keeping that open. And that's critically important because we're the only evangelical church anywhere in that little area there. So, so yeah. that's, that's so, me. How many people do you see on a Sunday morning at your church? Anywhere between 10 and 15 right now. When I, the, my first Sunday there, we, we, there was 17 of us. And then when um, the evangelical message started to come out, we started picking up more people. And just before COVID, we decided to join BCNE, and that closed a church split, and some people who didn't like Southern Baptists left, and we catapulted right down uh, under 10 people, and that was perfect for COVID. That made it, so we never had to shut down. We always had services, so um, we baptized a, a ton of people. We've seen them come in and go on to churches that met more of their needs, but we're doing the Lighthouse vision, which means we're there for the for the people who are wrecked and need a place to find Jesus. And so we're happy with that. It'd be nice if we had another 20 people come in. We got <laughs> space in there for a couple hundred, according to the fire marshal. But I mean, we're we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're we're alive and we All thrive right. at being small. Uh we just had a pastor come last Saturday uh to preach at the church, and uh he made the comment, he said that were one of the friendliest places that he's ever visited and that he would absolutely recommend to anybody who lived in our area that they come to see us that's that's just a compliment to the people that i pastor they're they're wonderful um so we great. just we just want to continue to grow so great thanks ken 
All right, Mike, how about if you tell us a little about yourself and your church? Well, uh, my name is Mike Beckner, and I pastor Hope Baptist Church in Dennis, Massachusetts. I came here in uh, 1996, in the fall of 1996. I left uh, uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, where I was an associate pastor uh, at Atlantic Shores Baptist Church that had four services at two locations of all, about 1,800 people on Sunday morning, 1,200 in Sunday school, and uh, the Lord said he was going to send me back to a place I had lived previously when my dad got out of the Navy and I went to high school here and graduated here, but sent me back to a place I said I'd never come back to, to do a thing that I said I would never do, which was plant a church. And uh, so we came here uh, with no uh, no means of support, uh, no people. We just, we just came here, my wife and I, and uh, uh, we ended up picking up right away uh, my sister-in-law and her husband and started having Bible study at their house. And eventually now uh, the highest we've had as far as attendance since you asked, Ken, uh, we had 70 when we were in the bottom of the Dennis Senior Center. We moved upstairs there. Uh, then they renovated it and we had to move out to another building. But in the meantime, the Lord opened the door for us to buy two additional condo units in Swan River Plaza that we finished renovating. It took about two years uh, dealing with the town, buying it, doing all the renovations. Um, and we have a 70 seat sanctuary now with uh, a nursery and two classrooms downstairs. And we still own the original condo unit we bought, which was number seven across the parking lot. And we use that as our fellowship hall. And we run between 20 and 30 on Sunday. All right. I, I specifically ask these guys to share uh, that the, their attendance on Sunday morning is sometimes considered to be un, impolite to ask that, but I wanted them to share that uh, because I think it's key to understanding why we're spotlighting these guys, that they are doing community outreach uh, with smaller churches and how that's a lot of the churches in New England are smaller. And that does not mean you have to turtle up and just stay inside your building. You can still uh, reach your community for Christ, even with small churches. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the topic of discussion. Uh, so let's start out with uh, the question, uh, what are some ways you are making connections with uh, your community? Maybe uh, maybe you can each give us a, a couple of uh, uh, things that your your churches are doing. Uh, Mike, why don't you start this one? Okay, well, when we, when we first got here, we did what I guess you would call the traditional contacting. And so we, we got out a map and we were in the senior center and we, we drew a mile radius around it. And we just started going out on Saturday mornings, dropping off Gospels of John and a inf little information piece about, about our church. Uh, we gave out over the course of that first year about 3,000 uh, Gospels of John and, and those tracks. And, and of course, we did uh, special Easter Sunday push as well. Um, we um, also have done, uh, we did uh, music in the park where we had collegiate ministries come and, and sing. Uh, and so we offered that. Um, we've done some other, other avant-garde things that I'll just mention if you want to explore them more you know, um, we did, we actually have my two car salt box detached garage here set up as a CrossFit gym. And we, we were doing outreach through that. I'm a CrossFit instructor and, uh, and we had people coming, um, uh, especially my daughter who was a, co a college graduate, all, teacher friends of hers and police officers that she knew, uh, they were coming and working out in the, in the, in the garage and, uh, um, our, and now we're getting ready to start doing a thing to, to reach out to the community and see. We want to see how this works. Our, our building is in Swan River Plaza, which is right on Route 134, which is the main north-south road in Dennis. And it we're just above Route 28. So it's highly traveled. And we're in the end unit 14 with our sign there. We're getting ready to put a sandwich board sign there whenever anyone is, whenever we have anyone from our church, including myself in the office, with a, it says, need prayer, stop in. We want to pray with you. And we want to see if anybody takes us up on that because we've had people come as a result of seeing our regular signs. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, perhaps there'll be some folks who see it over time and then one day they just pull in. Wow. All right. How about, how about you, Ken? So what have I done to reach out? Oh gosh. A little bit of everything. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, uh, 
just to give you an example, Palm Sunday this week, what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be taking palms that we have and we'll be giving them out on the sidewalk after church to people that go by. We'll also be bringing some up to the nursing home that's close by to us that we had services in pre-COVID. Um, and so we'll be trying to use that as a seed of conversation with folk. Um, and then at Easter time, we, uh, we have a sunrise service up in the town cemetery, uh, one of the town cemeteries up at the main drag there. Um, and so we sing up from the grave, they arose in a believer cemetery. Um, and then we invite people back for a breakfast and then our uh, community uh, Easter service. And so that's one way we do that. Um, and then at Christmas time, we do a caroling up on the common. We invite the whole town to come out and we've had the firemen and policemen help us with that. Uh, they transport our manger scene up there and set it up. And we have people bring gifts to the manger, meaning we advertise that it's for a crisis pregnancy center. So they bring things like diapers and things like that, uh, baby stuff, gift cards for new moms. And we donate all the gifts to the manger to our local crisis pregnancy center. But people come and they sing Christmas hymns and we share scriptures and we do that just before Christmas. Um, and then at St. Patrick's Day, we have, uh, what we do is we reach out to the firemen and policemen. We've done this three years now. Uh, because Patrick was the first responder to Ireland, we invite our first responders in and we give them a free corn, beef and cabbage dinner with all the fixings. And I sneak in a little gospel presentation about St. Patrick's message up in Ireland and, and what the what the gospel is. Um, and so that's been really good. And that gets people excited. And uh, the police say that we're one of the few people, few places that actually appreciates them in a time when people don't like police, where they're thanking them for their service. And we give them a safe place. We had um, this last one that we just did. We had 18 between their families and, and folk that came out from our town, first responders that came in, and it was really fun. They just got to relax and chat and talk and with us and um, people who say that they would never step foot in the church because lightning would strike them or the place would catch on fire. Um, we try to get them in with all, all kind of other things that, that we do. We've done um, on Halloween, we've had, uh, we've set up the church with uh, all kind of games and activities and things inside and invited children to come in with their parents and taken them through a, a program inside there. Um, COVID killed that the last time, but we were doing that. So anything that floats, anything, you know, we'll try all, all kind of different things. And, and there are people that come in through it. You know, it, it's a slow go. Uh, it takes a while to get to know people, you know, and, and I appreciate uh, the pastor here who's saying that he's been there, what, 25 years or something like that in your location. I've only been there. This is I'm going in my seventh year and I still am getting to know People around. We have to hang a, a open sign out because people keep saying, telling us, "Oh, we didn't know your church was open." You know, so we try to have things on the lawn, signs for the different holidays. And uh, this week, we're going to be setting up a a, a big rock scene that uh, we roll the stone away from for Easter uh, for the tomb, and it's a double thing because it's also for Palm Sunday. Shows Jesus riding in, and then we cover that up with a rock that we roll away and and so we use the lawn you know what i mean because people drive by all the time and so they're seeing a, a hidden message yeah so, i thought i thought that was interesting when uh when mike was sharing that he, they've used the sign and then i'm like i know ken uses his signs yeah. uh so both of you are, are finding signs to be something effective to use i think that's it's a silent preacher there's no there's no such thing as a silent preacher right just kidding yeah. There is with the sign, right? So it's also interesting that Ken mentioned about the fire department because we're in discussions right now with the fire department, which is on a diagonal over the trees behind us. You can almost hit it throwing a baseball. And I was just over there a couple of weeks ago because we have to get our annual inspection, building inspection, and talking with them and asking them what we might be able to do to minister to the firehouse there. And so we're we're in active discussions now about how best to serve them. And um, I think that's one of the, you know, because I think our, our fire department in particular, because they make so many emergency calls, 
they'll be a great they'll be a great resource because they meet people they meet people in need all the time and uh so you know that's an exciting thing and um we also prior to covid ken had mentioned you know that i guess that's kind of a demarcation line in a lot of our ministries we uh god actually had a nursing home pleasant bay nursing home called us up because they had a church that was doing a church a church service on uh during the week and they had called up and if you can believe this i know i know you folks who are on are going to find this hard to believe this is exactly what happened the, uh, the lady said the church that was doing it uh each week or each month once a month called up and said that the ch their church has gotten so big that they can't come anymore and yeah, yeah and i i didn't know what to say and i said well we're not big so uh and even if we did we'd just come more often and i asked her how she found us she said she she looked in of all places the yellow pages which we were in at the time and she said i just started going down and when i saw where it said hope baptist she said i knew you were who i was supposed to call because these people need hope and i said well we'll come and we did it for we did it for six years we saw a lot of salvations uh people who were in the home uh there started inviting their family members to come because it was open on when, the sunday that we were there and uh we actually saw salvations i did I actually did a baptism i i actually became a methodist for about 10 minutes because i had to pour from a bottle to baptize this lady in a wheelchair and uh but at any rate that's another story but um it was a, it was a wonderful ministry uh and um uh, the one of the ladies that we led to the Lord there, she was a tough nut too. And uh, but she started a Bible study there for women, and uh, she has since passed away. But uh, you know those those sometimes people say uh, uh, nursing home ministry is you know old fashioned and passe, and it's you know we have better things that we can do. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And I, in being honest here, there were some Sundays when our church was over and we were going there. I thought, oh, Lord, I really don't want to do this today. And by the time <laughs> we were done, I was always energized. It was just such a blessing to me. I felt like I was cheating somehow. Yeah. So, so Mike, you mentioned CrossFit. Is that something that you were already interested in and decide to use it for ministry? Or is it something you thought you'd get into for the purposes of ministry? Yes, it was something that I was already interested in. And uh, I'll, if, if I can, I'll explain it. I actually coach cross country and track at one of the local high schools at Sturgis uh, East Charter Public High School in Hyannis. I've been doing it for 16 years and uh, nine years. This is the ni tenth, ninth year of coaching track because I was part of the found uh, the beginning of the track part uh, my son was a, a student at Sturgis my youngest son and he ran cross country and he came to me and I had run here at Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School and had had success there and then when I was out in the Navy and he said dad you got to come and help us or we're going to be horrible forever <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I you know I said well you know they're not looking for an interloper for sure well it turned out the interim coach was a guy I knew from high school the way God worked and so I helped that year and then they had an opening and they asked me to apply and they hired me and I explained to them I was a Southern Baptist pastor I said you know what you're getting into and they said you're what we need and uh, uh, anyway uh, so uh, that has been a great opportunity but through that another friend of mine who was a coach was involved in CrossFit and he said why aren't you involved in it and when I saw what it was I just fell in love with it and um, I also had done five tough mutters so you know that's kind of what my family does. And, uh, and so we were working out in the garage and my daughter kept saying, dad, I, I have a friend who wants to come. I, I know somebody else who wants to come. Is it okay? And I just said, okay, yeah, bring them. And, uh, and that's when we realized, you know, think about Henry Blackaby experiencing God. What is God doing? Uh, he's bringing <laughs> these people, he's bringing these people here. So, uh, all right, we better get hot. And so that's so that's what we did. And so uh, in a given week, we'd have anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 uh, different uh, folks in ages, you know, 18 to 28 who were there. And I was I was training them and uh, uh, competing at the same time. I was I was competing in those days at 68. Now, those days are a little bit behind me, but uh, but <laughs> it was it was great because you're meeting people on ground where they you have that common interest 
And, and it was easy to say to people when I was, as it is with my cross country team, explaining to them, the way you've been created is marvelous. And the spine is the greatest mechanical invention ever. And God put it in you. And they'll listen to you talk about how they're created and that they're created an image of likeness of God. And they have value where they probably wouldn't anywhere else. Hmm. And so um, I say to people all the time, uh, you know, what do you have in your hand? I mean, that's what God said to Moses, right? What do you have in your hand? Well, throw it down. And so I say to I say to pastors and, and Christians all the time, what is it that you have in your hand? What is it you do? For a while, we had a lady at our church because there was a lady who knit. And uh, so she offered to teach women to knit. And she had six to 10 people there. And they knit they knitted blankets to give to the crisis pregnancy center here uh, on the Cape. And so those kind of things dovetail, right, right Ken? Uh, you, you do one thing and it assists you in doing something else as well. And and they're very small things and it doesn't take much, it doesn't take much effort and just a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of money. Um, and then we were able to get yarn donated for free and that kind of thing. And, uh, and so, you know, as you were saying about small churches, sometimes I think we get we start thinking about, you know, these grandiose global kind of things, but there's so many smaller things that we can do here that have big impact. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to point out that this is another area of commonality between the two of you, because Ken, can you tell me why you in particular do your Easter sunrise service at a cemetery? That's very specific to you. Uh-oh, we've lost you. We've lost Ken. Well, well, why Well, wait a minute. You you want to ask me that same question specific, <laughs> specific to us? <laughs> well, I was just pointing out that the CrossFit was specific to you. There's a specific yeah. reason for Ken. I don't know if we can get him back on. There's a specific reason for Ken that he does stuff in a cemetery. And uh, and I think that that is uh, interesting how he uses he uses something unique to him. And maybe we'll get back to it. Well, uh, we've had some we've had some some people who heard other churches who have heard that we were doing CrossFit got in touch with us to ask us about that and and said like how did you get started? What you know how did you make it work? Um, what, how was it received? And so I wasn't expecting, you know, I wasn't expecting that because we were, we weren't advertising it. Huh. Well, right, Ken, can you hear me now? yes. Okay. So explain okay. why, why you in particular do your sunrise service in a cemetery. All right. So we were, um, well, we, we also, I want to mention another thing before that we, when the Catholic church existed up the road from us. Uh, it's since moved and consolidated. We did a good Friday walk with them. And being that I had the only beard in the clergy, um, I got to play the part of Jesus and carry the cross down. So that introduced a lot of the Catholic folk around our church into our church because we started with a service up at their end and then we would finish down at our church. And all these folk came flooding into our service to hear a gospel message. The same thing happens very work in. I go out and I fly for the veteran. Um and working with hundreds of school kids down here in Pawtucket for, for years. Um we would go into the school, we would have them come out and adopt a cemetery and I would get the flags from the state and then we would go out and now everybody that's in the cemetery understands about death. You're talking about death. What we could do with that is we're giving them the whole all colonial cemeteries because I, I do this for the historical society we're at about 100 cemeteries so what I do is I tell people that are standing there where is the sun right now and they're like well it's right there and I say well all these graves are facing east their feet are facing east the reason is is that they wanted to stand up at the resurrection when Jesus returns he comes from the east to the west and I get so many conversations with people. Is that what these people believed, you know? And what is this resurrection thing? What does it mean? I had a lady ask me one day, she said, what does resting, rest in peace mean? You know, and then what does it mean sleeping in Jesus? You know, that was written on another tombstone. 
and the and it just throws you into all kinds of things. One of my favorite stones, and I got to tell you here, and this is only going to happen. We've lost you again, Ken. I don't know what's going on. So if you didn't pick up from that, the reason I'm asking Ken about cemeteries is that Ken is involved with cemeteries for the Historical Society in Rhode Island. Uh, he's like the main cemetery rehab guy. And he goes around and volunteers for this as well as being a pastor. And so he is very familiar with cemeteries and cemetery iconography all the images and statements on cemeteries. And so this is why he does his um, his Easter sunrise service in a cemetery because he knows how to use uh, the, the imagery and the statements on, on the, the, the surrounding graves, gravestones in order to share the gospel. Uh, and he's very familiar with that. So I thought that was an interesting connection between the two of you. It, it's expressed very differently. So Mike, you're doing CrossFit. Uh, because that's something that you know and is, uh, you know, that you enjoy doing. And Ken is using cemeteries, uh, which is something that is dear to his heart. Uh, and so you guys are using what you're familiar with and your your own uh, unique talents and, and gifts in order to uh, do outreach. And I think that that is really cool. And now, Ken, you're muted. Uh, who who has a sunrise service in a cemetery? <laughs> right. The cemetery guy. <laughs> yep. Oh, you keep on cutting out, Ken. I don't know what's going on with your 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 tech over there. Uh, all right. Uh, let's uh, keep on going here. Uh, so, uh, Mike, maybe we maybe you can uh, help us with the. Well, I know that uh, Sandy. Uh, wanted me to ask you about the, the prayer initiative that you're doing at your church. Let's do that for the moment. Okay. Uh, um, well, um, one of the things that, that, that I'm convinced of is that the faster, not the fastest, that's not the right way to say it. The best way to reach people is by engaging them in relationship and so many of our folks find it difficult to have conversations with people because in the back of their mind the idea is i got to get to the gospel message i got this one shot for this gospel message and so i realized one day that i was naturally doing something every place that i went and that it was reaping spiritual benefits, but it was helping establish relationships that I could bridge across the spiritual conversations. And I thought, well, I could teach this to our people real simply. It takes like three and a half minutes to teach it. Everywhere you go, when you step up to a counter, whether it's at the 7-Eleven or the Burger King or the stop and shop with the cashier, the first thing those people say to you is, how are you? And so I always say, I'm great. I'm here with you. And I smile at them. They always smile back and they say, oh, that's so nice. And then I say, well, there are a lot of more uncomfortable places we could be if God chose than right here having conversation with each other. And then they say, well, that's really true, isn't it? And I go, yes, it is. And then I tell I tell them, I say, I, you know, I'm the pastor at Hope Baptist Church. And I'm wondering, is there anything that I can pray for you about? Yes. And often they will tell me. Now, I don't do I don't always get to the prayer part the very first time. And that's kind of I don't know if it's the ingenious part of it, but I always make sure that I go when I go to stop and shop over. I look for that person again and I go through that line every time until I get to the place where I can say to them, hey, listen, I said, you know, I come through and I you ask me how I am. I ask you how you are. Is there anything that I can pray for you about? And we also uh, take this booklet, this this uh, Seven Wonders booklet. It's a it's just a really great it's a great piece with seven questions that people wonder about. Do I have value? Is there life after death and all? And I hand it to them over time. I'll I'll carry it and I'll say, Hey, I was thinking about you this week. 
And uh, how, how have you been doing? And hey, I thought you might find this interesting. And so we've taught our folks to do that. And they all put a little bit different spin on it. So when somebody says to them, how, you know, how, how are you? They'll, you know, some of them say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm having a great week or whatever. But the bottom line is just simply in a relaxed fashion, begin establishing that relationship. And so we've we've been able to get the gospel out to people. We've had a few visitors that have come as a result of that. But it's always interesting when I'm in like stop and shop and I don't realize that one of the cashiers that I've entered into a relationship with is down the line and I'm in this line here and they'll just call across, hey, Mike. And uh, and and it's just very, very simple way to engage the community one by one, uh, whether it's your bank teller, whether it's your post postal carrier, um, whoever it is. And, and not only that, but to get over your you know fears and anxieties about speaking about spiritual things with people and talking to them about Jesus. It just become begins to become the natural thing. And we've had folks in the church say, you know what, Pastor? Uh, I, I find I just do it every time. I don't even have to think about it. It just happens. And I say, well, that's because it's who you've become. Great. All right. Now, uh, I'm about to ask what principles or opportunities help you decide what you're going to engage in. But but, and I think we've already covered some of that, actually. Uh, but I did want to point out that because I know Ken, that my impression of Ken and from talking to Ken is that he'll try anything. And, you know, uh, you know, when it comes to outreach, when it comes to sharing the gospel and making connections with the community, it, you know, if it's a possibility, he'll give it a shot. And I think that that is a really commendable attitude, especially for small churches. Uh, small churches have a tendency to tr they want to try the thing that that succeeds every time. And I actually think small churches have to do the opposite. Small churches have to be willing to try things that will fail. And you do that over and over and over and over and over again until you find the thing that sticks. And I, I know that about Ken. My my impression from this conversation with Mike is that it's probably the same with you, that you'll try something at, you know, at least once. And if it doesn't work, oh, well, we won't do that one again. And I think that that is a really important principle. But let's... I. Now that I got that principle out of the way, maybe there's something else. Ken, Ken, is there something else? Is there other principles or? Uh, right. Are... Can you hear me? Can you hear me right now? I can hear you now. Okay. This is why All I'm right. asking you the question first. <laughs> so, what I'm going to tell people is, come Memorial Day, everybody goes out and put flags out on veteran graves. Veterans are dying out. There are not that many new ones that are coming up in the ranks. And so, what happens when you go out and you volunteer to help these guys and you bring people in? Um, I, I just did one with a Mormon church. When do you get a chance to talk to Mormons about the gospel? I had a chance to talk with a Mormon church about the gospel because we're in a cemetery and I was the facilitator. What happens is you get to lead them in prayer. You get to, because you're there, you pray you and they listen to you and you're out there leading them around. So that's an opportunity. Um, and we just did a, a cemetery work day down the road from our church with some people that have never been in a church. Just they don't go to church. And so we were in there and they're like, oh, so you're the pastor of that place. And we had coffee and donuts down there for them. And we were leading them out there and doing this. And they were getting their fingernails dirty in history and lifting up the mockers from under the dirt that have been buried there. We were explaining all the different things. So we use that as an opportunity. Um, like I said, working with the Catholic Church up the road when they were there, be, being part of a Good Friday service. Uh, we just said right up right up front, no Mary. Don't be talking about Mary. Don't be doing things that are going to be, and we won't do anything that's going to be objectionable to you, but we got to preach the gospel. I heard one of the best sermons I've ever heard in a Catholic church on a Good Friday service. Guy just straight from the scripture. And I was like, wow. And people are asking questions. Because you're out there doing something that nobody else ever thought to do. You know, like you said, you got to try, you got to try things, you know. So handing out palms outside the church, um, we're going to get people to stop. And they're like, they're trying to pay us. And we're like, we don't want your money. We're just doing this because we're telling you that the king. Oh, we lost your audio again. Uh, I just want to point out from, from talking to Ken that the palm thing is 
Ken knowing his community, knowing that there's a Catholic background in the community and taking palms is something that they would want out of their Catholic church. Ken is also sharp that he knows that the uh, the Catholic church and the actually the the Episcopal church down the street closed down. So there's this vacuum going on in in the in his community where these people who are used to getting a palm aren't getting them. And so that's so he's t he's kind of filling this gap that these Catholics want filled and the Episcopals want filled. So uh, so that's that's part of what he's doing. He's analyzing the community, seeing this need that's out there, and then he's filling it himself. So the cemetery stuff, that's Ken's uh, that's Ken's like uh, big, big thing. And so he's able to take advantage of all those opportunities. So that's that's how he's choosing those. So so, Mike, how about you? Like uh, what? What principles or, or opportunities help you decide what you're going to engage in? What makes you say, you know, this is what I'm going to try? Well, one of the biggest things is we look at we look at what the what the gifts and the talents and the abilities and the things that individuals are involved in. Uh, what's their passion? Um, for a number of years, we did uh, we Christmas caroled at Patriot Square Shopping Center. Uh, and we had anywhere from six to eight people, and we were there for three to four hours, um, uh, three different nights during wow. the, peak of the shopping season. And I'm telling you, that is like Tesla and all the other companies should bring their cars there to test. It's such a wind tunnel in the winter. But uh, but and people asked us, other churches asked us, and so we we had a banner, and it said it said Hope Baptist Church Church's gift to our town. And we were there caroling. It was just we were doing it as a as a gift to the town. People tried to give us money when they went by, and we were like, "No, we're not. Well, that's not what we're here for." Well, don't can't can't you give it to a charity? We're like, we just if you want to send it to a charity, do it. We're doing this for you. And cars would drive up and roll the windows down, and the, you'd hear the people talking. We'd give them a gospel of John, um, and um, and uh, some folks from other churches who went by said, "How how did you get to do this?" How, how did you get them to let you do this? And we looked at them and we said, we went to Chamberlain Real Estate, which manages it. And we asked if we could, and they said yes. And so I'd say that sometimes what what what's the principle or opportunity? Well, you think God may be leading you to do this. And then sometimes you go, yeah, but they'll never let us do it. Well, don't say that. Just go and ask. And and when you ask, just ask. Don't not a lot of other words. Just say this. We we've been praying, and we think God would have us do this as a gift to our town or to to bless you. Can we? And then just stop. And they'll stand there for a few seconds. Sometimes they say, "We'll have to call you back." Nobody's ever asked us that. Or sometimes they go, "That'd be wonderful." Well, the Christmas caroling thing. When we asked, they turned and looked at each other in the office and said. How come nobody's ever done this before? <laughs> and uh, I knew we were in. Yeah. So my guess is you. Part of what made you think that is you actually had people that would enjoy singing for three hours. Yes. That's well, funny. let me just say that the pastor and the wor and my worship leader at the time we sang for three hours and we had one hour shifts for our people who came and filled in. So. Okay. But 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 you had to have people who are willing, to yes, and, and interested that's, in doing that. Yes, and that's one of the you know one of the big things. I think I think one of the reasons why some things fail is because, um, and and I don't want this to sound wrong, but you know we hear about things that happen in large churches, and 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 then we think, well, maybe if we replicate that here, and like <laughs> you were saying that Ken, you know, Ken knows his. He knows his town and we know our town. I don't think we know our town as well as we might, but we're working on it. And uh, and plus, you know, needs of places change. And so, as you were saying, a thing that may have caught people's attention before doesn't anymore. Um, uh, when I first was here, we had an individual in our church who had come from a church up in, in Boston and he was an older gentleman. Um, you know, I'm 68 now. So, you know, but he was he was older than that when I got here. And his thing was, we need to have ham and bean supper on Wednesday night. Well, I'm not opposed to ham and bean suppers on Wednesday night, <laughs> but we didn't have anywhere to do it. And and that didn't strike us as what people were looking, you know, people, you know, we didn't think people were going to gravitate, gravitate to that. But we have thought about some other things. We thought about doing a pancake breakfast uh, free. 
um, using the Dennis Senior Center and on Saturday morning, just have a pancake breakfast. It's open. Anybody can come and come get some pancakes. It's cheap. It's easy to do. It, you know, paper plates, that that kind of thing. So that's something that we have on on the drawing board. Um, and we just need to have somebody to coordinate it, number one, because the pastor can't do everything. And number two, people that will stick with it once we start it. Because the, the only thing worse than, I think, than not doing a thing, trying a thing, is you do it and it's successful and people are looking for it, but it disappears and they don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Uh, yeah, we, we, do, we tried, uh, caroling at our church, uh, multiple times at, because we had people who wanted to carol, but, uh, as a, the people who like to carol in our church are getting older, it's getting harder and harder. Yeah. And we recently tried it at a, in a new neighborhood that's closer to the church than what we had been doing. And we had the same experience where people wanted to give us money. They, it was awkward for them. They didn't know what to do. And that kind of told me maybe this it's time we we put this outreach to rest uh, for our community uh, because people it's not being received well and we're running out of the people to do it. So that that is that's a key. And the reason that we, yeah, we didn't go into a neighborhood just because we thought we'd get a bigger bang for the buck there by being at the, you know, at the shopping center with all the the foot traffic. And, and uh, um, yeah, it's been a few years since since we've done it. But, uh, you know, at, at our church, when when we when we when we have to shift gears, we we put things in suspended animation, which means they could come back. But uh, like usually that. usually they don't. But, uh, <laughs> you know. But at least that way, you know, so people say, you know, they go, so we're going to ax this. And I go, we never ax anything. We just put it in suspended animation and see when God might want to use it again in the future. Yeah, the idea never goes away, right? The idea never goes away. And who knows? You know, I mean, vinyl records are coming back. So Carol, <laughs> they come back. So have, right. you guys tried a, have you guys tried a community caroling event? Like where you go up and you do like on the town common? We did it at the, we, yeah, we did it at a shopping center. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. That, I, might, that I, might be what he has for a common, Ken. Right, 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 right. Okay. Not every town has one. So, right. uh, so all right. So, unfortunately, we only have a few more minutes left to, to cover this topic. But uh, I want to start with Ken on this one. Uh, and that is, uh, we're I, I'm going to ask the question, how, how are you encouraging your church to get involved with the community? So, I'm actually going to emphasize the encouraging part, the motivating part. I am interested, uh, especially with small churches, uh, the problem is volunteers get worn out really fast. uh, And yet we still have to keep doing outreach, right? So I want to start with Ken, because Ken, you're co-vocational. I want to know how you keep yourself motivated and then also how you motivate the people in your congregation. So how do you keep yourself going with uh, work, and then also trying to do outreach at your church and all that. Prayer. <laughs> Absolutely prayer. Can you hear me? Yep. So prayer. Um, and you just have to know the pulse of your people and what they're willing to do. Uh, we said we have a bike path, the Blackstone River bike path that goes through our area. So I said to the people who are coming to our Sunday school class in the morning, I don't know. It's like, Ken, when you start talking for a while, your mic just cuts out. I don't know what it is. It's weird. I do know he went out on the bike path and handed out water on the bike path. But I I was I was trying to get his secret, how he keeps all those people out there doing it. Maybe he can type it in the chat for us or something. Uh, because we have so few minutes left, M- Mike, how about if you can answer that question? Maybe how you keep yourself motivated and how you... Uh, Uh, keep your church people engaged. Yeah, well, first of all, I I think one of the most underestimated things in the church, sadly, is prayer. And um, and so that's what I would say first. But secondly, again, we look at what people 
the people that God has put in our church and what they have a passion for in their own life, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's singing, whether it's, you know, just acts of service. We have some people who they just love doing for other people. So going to the bike path and handing out water, we did a couple of things like that at a major intersection in the summer when traffic was backed up here on the Cape, you know, and, and uh, gave out water uh, at one point, uh, just, uh, but, and I, and I think also, not, you know, each church can only go at the pace and rhythm that the people who are, are there are prepared to do at that time. And so, you know, as a shepherd, my job is to make sure that I don't load the sheep. The sheep aren't loaded so much that the legs go out from under them and they don't ever want to do anything again. And and so, you know, I tell our congregation all the time and young pastors that I meet is that we can't we can't do everything for everyone, but that shouldn't keep us from doing what we can do for the ones that we can do it for. And so, you know, uh, I heard a pastor say recently that he looks also at what other churches, evangelical churches are doing. And he said, we don't attempt to replicate that. If they have, if they, if this church has whatever the particular thing is and it's going great guns, he goes, then we don't need to replicate that and compete with that. We can, we can put our efforts in this thing over here. And so I think that's, you know, that's important. And I think that sometimes pastors have to give themselves a break in all honesty, because we feel guilty. We're just not doing enough. I mean, I've been here for 26, going on 27 years high of 70 people. We run 20 to 30 right now. We've got this new little sanctuary that we, we know we could load up twice if God would send the people. Um, and, and so we pray and we say, look, we're, you know, some plant, some water, and God gives the increase. We only have to be faithful doing what God has called us to do in the moment. And uh, so sometimes I think pastors start to feel guilty because we're not getting enough results. I say leave the results to God. Just be faithful and do what you're supposed to do. And he'll he'll send up. He'll send the people he wants to be at your church. So I I'm I'm loving what, what you're saying about not not overloading your church. I'm also loving what you're saying about if you uh and I think Ken was saying something similar too, that if if you if you find things that your people want to do then uh, it's a lot easier for them to stay motivated, interested, and engaged. Uh, but uh, here, how about this question? See if you guys, either of you, can come up with an answer to this question. Uh, I think a lot of churches, in a lot of churches, the pastors look at their congregation and say, yeah, I don't want to overload my congregation, but currently there's not really any danger of that. Most people in my church are not engaged enough either inside the church or outside the church in outreach. So is there anything that you guys have done uh, that have helped kind of light a fire under your people uh, so that they get up to kind of a, you know, a, a more realistic form of engagement? Ken, how about you start? Oh, we still don't have you, Ken. <laughs> Any, anything you want to say, Ken, just type in the chat and I can read it out. Uh, how about you, Mike? Yeah, I would say that the the, the biggest thing in, in my, my time in ministry has, has been that the mentoring aspect with people. So often as pastors, you know, we, we have we see holes that need to be plugged and we see somebody that we think will fill it and we plug them in and and we don't we don't come alongside them um, to make sure that they feel comfortable doing what they're doing. And so if you look, if you find somebody who has a passion for something and you explain to them how it can fit in outreach, and then you work with them in that for a period of time, they're more likely to be willing to take that on. And then you've got to go back and you've got to uh, refresh that over time. Once you get them plugged in the hole, if you don't keep track of what they're doing and you, you're not out there with them from time to time, you shouldn't be surprised if eventually uh, they disappear because they need that support as, as well. And they need to be able to get to you as the pastor when they have questions or concerns or even anxieties about, you know, how things are going. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, I've been a child soccer coach one one season uh and you know not my cup of tea let's put it that way uh 
And, but I actually felt like that I did it a competent job. I just didn't really enjoy it all that much. And, uh, and it definitely makes you think about, okay, Pat a little bit because my job was not to play soccer, right? My job was to uh, motivate kids to play soccer and help them do it better and be encouraging given the tools that they needed to succeed. And I, I think about that as a pastor, the only difference is a pastor is also supposed to be doing evangelism. Uh, but you know, what can, what tools can I give those people and how can I encourage them and come alongside them, you know, take them off when they need a break and then send them back out pumped up and excited again. I, I, and I think that's very good. Uh, Ken says uh, that they had to de-emphasize numerical results. And he told their, his folks that they are one piece of a chain. In our case, we are often the rescue swimmers that help people out of the waves. Don't worry about the numbers. Do what we do well. Amen. Uh, so I, I think that that's a, yeah, I, I do think, uh, and there's different, actually, there's different numbers you can aim for. I'm about to write a blog post for the BCNE about numbers, uh, thinking in terms of small churches, how actually numbers are still important. But you might think in terms of numbers of people that we actually make contacts with, numbers of people that came to our event. Hey, look, we're a small church of 25 people, but we just had 50 people come to an event. That's twice the number of people in our church came to our event. Uh, you know, stuff like that. You 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 start looking for the numbers, aiming for numbers that are actually achievable for, for your church. Uh, and you don't have to count heads every time. But I'm just saying like, hey, we had a lot of people come to our event. That's a big deal. We, we stood at the, the shopping mall and I think of how many hundreds of people heard us sing and saw our, you know, saw our church was there, uh, you know, okay. So we had three people come to our church on Sunday, but we've also broadcast, uh, you know, the good news of Jesus to hundreds more people. Uh, and those and, are numbers that you can actually emphasize and highlight. And, and Randall, you mentioned about, uh, about coaching soccer and it wasn't your cup of tea, but um, you know, I, I, I coached youth baseball before I became a high school cross country coach. And I'll tell you there, you know, th there are just so many opportunities to have contact with people you as a coach that you would never have. Uh, we have, th we've had three families that I've, whose runners I've coached at, at the high school who have come and been a part, been a part of our church because I, ministered met them where they were i mean john chapter four jesus with the woman at the well and i've i've prayed with teachers in the school they've asked me to pray for them because they know i'm a pastor um i've had families that are not saved parents come to me and say you know my child's prospering here in this running you know in this cross country program tell me what you're doing with my child so that I can replicate that in my home. And then I begin to share with them the verses about training up your child and the way they should go and so forth and so on. And then they bring other people and say, I have a friend who needs to talk to you. So I would say this, that some of the most unassuming things that don't seem to be spiritual at all. I mean, you know, so many people are like death on sports, ah, but it's, it's a great opportunity because there's a preoccupation. So I'd say, you know, if you, if you, if you're in a bowling league or you're in a badminton league, or you're, you know, the, the, I mentioned the knitting lady in our church, look for those people. And it goes to your numbers about how many people are we touching with the truth of the gospel and our changed life. I'm doing this because God's changed my life through Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here coaching your child. Otherwise, I'd be off doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Ken, do you want to try and say one more thing real quick? With everything he said, you know, it's it's good stuff. You got to you got to find your niche whatever it is and you got to do it well. Amen. We just got to keep trying different things, but you know, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. So it's that Hudson Taylor, right? Right. So, I mean, it's the same with us. And the only idea that's that's a bad idea is the one you never do. 